<clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. So I work on the um, gut microbiota. So what is a healthy microbiota? This is an important question. Do we, do we have an idea? After the Human Microbiome Project, do we know what a healthy microbiota is? And I see nobody's rushing to the mics, and that's good because <laughs> I would argue that we don't know what a healthy microbiota is. We actually, most of us in this room, probably do not have a healthy microbiota. We have a deteriorated microbiota. The microbiota of a healthy person is not equivalent to a healthy microbiota. And the reason is that we have this microbiota inside us that controls much of our biology, but it's incredibly plastic. It actually um, changes on the order of hours after we eat a meal. It changes on the order of days and even tracks long-term dietary trends, perhaps even for a society. And it's this plasticity or malleability of the microbiota that makes it such an attractive therapeutic target, but it also is a property that probably has um, led to its own deterioration over time. And so um, the, this plasticity was probably incredibly advantageous in an ancient environment where we had to adjust to day-to-day -day or season-to-season -season variability in, in our diet, um, but this has probably led to, to big problems recently. And one of the big problems is that our human genome that must interact with this microbiota evolves at a relatively slow rate, but our microbiota can evolve at a relatively fast rate. And this asymmetry in the rate of evolution has led to an incompatibility. Our modern lifestyle has probably selected a microbiota that our human genome no longer recognizes as well. And so our human genome is essentially trying to interact with this foreign microbial entity that's inside of us. And this is a big problem. And so one of the things that's come out of all the microbiota research over the past several years is that diversity appears, appears to be incredibly important in the microbiota, that it's linked to health, and we don't know the mechanisms, we don't know which way the, the causation arrows point, but we do know that diversity is important, that is the variety of microbes that are present in your microbiota. And we, we see in many disease states, microbiota diversity plummets. We also see that in dietary intervention studies, that individuals with a more diverse microbiota actually respond better to the dietary intervention, that they have better improvement of clinical markers of inflammation, metabolic disease, compared to individuals with a low diversity microbiota. So diversity appears to be very important. But how do we foster diversity, or how do we regain diversity if we've lost diversity? Well, this is an important question, too. And diet appears to be an important part of the equation. So the complex carbohydrates that are present in our diet that are present in dietary fiber actually fuel the microbiota. They're the major fuel for the metabolism of this microbiota. And there's good evidence that they're linked to maintaining diversity in the microbiota. But our Western diet has all but eliminated these dietary fibers from our diet and left us with eating, on average, as Americans, about 15 grams of dietary fiber per day. And this is much less than our ancient ancestors. Our ancient ancestors probably ate five to 10 times that amount of dietary fiber per, per day. And so what's the consequence of starving our microbial selves? Well, there are probably many consequences. One of them is that we lose diversity. We lose the members of the microbiota that are good at fermenting these dietary fibers. We also select for microbial community members that are actually good at eating mucus, the only carbohydrate that's left in the gut. And we have no idea what the consequences are of a lifetime of selecting for microbes that are gradually nibbling on this important immunological barrier. And third, and most importantly, probably, is we no longer generate short-chain fatty acids. So short-chain fatty acids are the fermentation end products that the microbes make if they're degrading and fermenting dietary fiber. And these get absorbed when they're made, they get absorbed into our bloodstream. And they play important regulatory roles. They regulate metabolism. They regulate the immune system, attenuating inflammation, as potentially Ruslan will talk about. And so dietary fiber appears to be incredibly important in fueling this community and these short-chain fatty acids, and yet we don't eat it. And so could it be that this new metabolic state, this new metabolic scenario, is actually critical in unexplaining a lot of the immune dis dysregulation that underlies many Western diseases. This is possible. 
And this isn't a new idea. Back in the 1970s, Dennis Burkett actually made roughage a household wor word because he believed that dietary fiber was linked to protection from Western diseases. And he didn't know about, or at least didn't have the mechanistic explanation of the microbiota. He had some great quotes, America is a constipated nation. <laughs> He also said if you pass small stools, you have to have large hospitals. <laughs> so what microbiota should we have? What, what microbiota did our ancient ancestors have? Well, we don't know that for sure, but we can infer what an ancient microbiota may have looked like by looking at traditional societies. And this is data from one such study out of Jeffrey Gordon's lab. And what's clear is that traditional societies have microbiotas that are very different than the Western microbiota. And one of the major findings is that our microbiota is way less diverse. They have, in traditional societies, a third again as many bacterial types or species as we have. So we've lost diversity, it appears. And this is very important. And this is just looking at bacterial diversity. We haven't yet described the differences in eukaryotes, in viruses, in archaea. Some of you may have heard of experimental helminth therapy for treating inflammatory bowel disease, perhaps recovering evolutionary, ancient, and important interactions that we've lost. So what are, what are the factors that made our microbiota go, go off the rails besides diet? Well, we heard about antibiotics this morning. There are probably many other factors that have influenced the microbiota in negative ways. And so where do we go from here? Do we want to recover diversity? And if so, how do we do this? Can we do this simply through diet? Do we have to reintroduce, reintroduce microbes that we've lost should we think of traditional populations as important repositories of microbes for reintroduction? And could there be deleterious or unintended consequences of now introducing microbes that we haven't interacted with under our modern biology, potentially modern epigenetic changes? So these are important questions, and I don't think anybody wants to go back in time, but I think we need to consider the microbiota when we think about new technologies, new medicines, new medical practices. And we need to think about the microbiota as being an important part of the equation for the rise in Western diseases. I'll hand it over to Ruslan. I think we were gonna go have Amanda um, go next.